recording. Um, but I hope that the materials I'm showing will be accessible to you and that you'll be able to look at it again if you need to. Um, because my wife says I am like a big hose pipe that the firemen use to put out a fire. And so much water comes out, people do not know how to process it. Anyway, my, uh, ask, I ask forgiveness if I say too much. Mm -hmm. But just on a more personal level, um, I was serving in uh, the Lord in Africa for 16 years. And during that time, I wrote a book, which I will show later, um, to help people pray for the world. And so it's an African book. And um, it was all developed in Africa. And uh, it's interesting that the two greatest uh, research efforts to analyze the Christian church were both produced in Africa. And I think this is an indication of the future. Bear in mind that Africa in 30 years time will be the only continent with many young people. And so Africa is going to form a lot of the future. If you as who are from Africa also contribute to making uh, the politics of the country better and the church more healthy, may God use you for that because Africa has could have a great future. Anyway, for the last, um, after I left Africa, I became part of the leadership team of WEC International, which is a big um, international mission agency of which Jeff is a part. And uh, in fact, our largest contingent in WEC is actually from Korea now. So um, that is a little bit of background. I've got, I, I've had two, well, I, my first wife died with cancer in 1992 and I married Robin, who is my wife now. I have three children of my first wife and they all love Jesus and are serving him in various ways. So now to our subject and we are so affected by what is happening in the world with this COVID pandemic. And I think we have to keep in mind that it's not wars that change things so much, it's pandemics. And this has been true throughout history. And so this COVID virus, which is symbolized on this picture here, is like a reset button it's going to change a huge amount of what is happening in the world, the way churches operate, the way missions operate, the way governments perceive things. It's massive what is happening. Who would have thought two years ago uh, that nearly every church in the world would stop meeting? And that's happened. And who would have thought that for years, countries would close their borders so that nobody could leave or enter. That has happened. And so we are living in an extraordinary time. And so I want to speak about world evangelization. Oh, it's not, why is it not working? Oh dear. Yeah, so uh, Patrick, instead of um, the typing your uh, keyboard, but just click uh, use your um, the my computer mouse. Oh, there we are. Okay. Yeah. For a moment, it seems to have frozen. So I want to speak about world evangelization in a post-COVID-19 age. And so let's look at a few things. What are the changes that are going to come? A lot of things are going to end. Some things are going to go down and some things are going to change radically. And this is the world you are preparing for. And we need to understand what is going on. One of the endings that I see is Western dominance. You know, for years, we from the West have thought we are the privileged ones. We know how to control everything, to move everything. Uh, the British Empire a, a century and a half ago 
managed to stop the world making slaves because they had global reach, a little country in Europe with global reach. The USA then took on that role, but we can see with the politics in the States and what is happening in Afghanistan, that that is changing. And we're moving into a world where, where there's far more um, equality in one sense. And we're seeing this in missions now, as I was mentioning about how many Koreans we have in WEC, we are becoming a very international mission. And this is the, the future. Another thing that's going to end is cheap travel. And so it's going to be much more expensive for people to move from continent to continent. Why is that? It's because for many years, the business class traveled on expensive seats and greater comfort. But the problem is that it also subsidized the economy seats. And so we're going to find that to travel from one country to another is going to become much more expensive. That's going to change a lot of our strategies about how we move and when we move. The idea of short-term mission trips is going to become less common. Privacy, one of the things that is ending is that we have to realize that anything that goes on the internet one day will be discovered and made public. And this is causing upheaval across the world. We see how the hackers, the, the wicked people on the internet are finding ways to steal passwords, to get into bank accounts and so on. And China has put in all this surveillance system so that every, they will know where every person in China is what they are doing, and maybe even what they are thinking. And so we are moving into a, a very strange world where privacy no longer exists. And then we have the problem that many of you know about objective news. Um, one of the problems we have as research, Christian researchers is that when I started writing Operation World, there was so little information I could find in Zimbabwe to write the book. I wrote letters that took months to get answers to. There were hardly any books, there was no internet. But now there's so much news and so much information that people retreat from getting a general view and just focus on the areas of their interest. And so we get bubble news and bubble, um, the bubbleization of the world has got to the point where it's bringing huge divisions. Look at the politics of the world because of the internet. Look at the way the politics in the United States has become so divided because one side never listens to what the other side is hearing. And it's going to be a real challenge in the future. Old church structures are going to fail. I was just hearing yesterday about a church of 200 people in this country, in my city, and they met for the first time as we come out of the pandemic. And they found that only 30 people wanted to come to church. We're going to find huge churches going bankrupt. The old mega church structure that has um, caught the interest of so many across the world, and especially in Africa. You've got these massive churches in some Anglophone countries in Africa. They're going to suffer hugely in the future. But in the West, it's going to be worse because not only are they going to lose lots of people, but the young people don't want to go to church anymore. And so they're going to go bankrupt. And so old church structures, old mission structures, we're going to have to change. But then we're going to see a number of declines. Globalization. You, remember, uh, you may remember, if you, re if you look at the news or hear the news, for instance, about the container ship from China that got stuck in the Suez Canal in Egypt. And it's caused huge disruption to the whole of Europe, 
because so many things on that ship were to be used in industry, in distribution, and it caused a huge uh, problem for, for manufacturers and, um, and tradespeople. But the globalization and the effect of so many people getting sick or going into quarantine has caused huge disruption. And people begin to realize that globalization isn't all a good thing. And so many are going to pull back from what we had um, when everything works smoothly. Globalization works great if countries and uh, everything is linked together, but it only needs a little thing to go wrong and everything changes. One of the other declines, sadly, which is related to privacy, is the decline in freedom. Freedom is going to become much less. We look at what's happened in Hong Kong, how the, uh, the British government in handing over Hong Kong to China in 1997, there was a specific agreement that the way the country ran or that, the, the, uh, that Hong Kong ran would remain the same for 50 years. But with the growing power of China, they ignored that and broke uh, the promise they had given. Freedoms are being eroded and nobody is going to stop it. And so many autocratic governments have used this pandemic to actually push for more control of their countries and their citizens. Freedoms have been diminished. Democracy is under attack. And if you look at what's happening, for instance, in the States, who wants what they have in the States as a democracy? It's not a very good uh, way to export the idea to other countries. What we're also seeing is a decline in, in wealth. Um, I put here that there's going to be a K recovery. Some people speak about a, a U recovery, it goes down and then up, or a, an L recovery, it goes down and stays down, or a K recovery is one where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And sadly, it is likely to be more that one. Financial giving is going to take a great big, already seeing this, money is going to become a much more difficult thing for Christian ministry. Then the changes that are happening, we're suddenly waking up to the fact that the world is changing, the climate is being affected, and people are beginning to get much more sensitive, and it's going to make life much more difficult as we try to adapt to a new way of living. Social life is going to change considerably. I mean, I'm used to uh, a Christian culture where we hug each other where we drink communion out of the same cup. Can we carry on with that kind of thing when we are much more sensitive about infection? Industries are going to change. Work styles are changing. I mean, in, in our situation here in Europe, uh, so many office workers began working from home. And as a result, the cities that they used to go to travel up to to work in are suffering hugely economically. All the rest, many restaurants are closing because the workers would go out for a meal in the midday and they're not going now. And it's affecting the transport, it's affecting the industries that support workers in centers of cities. Work styles are changing. And of course, we in missions are going to have to change. So that's a, a sort of um, rundown. I spent more time on that, but now let's move on. There'll be a new normal. And let's bear in mind that the turning points of history, the biggest turning points uh, that I, as some I'm listing here, um, the turning points of history were often caused by pandemics, not by invasions. For instance, the last one there, the empires of the Americas, the Spanish conquered the Americas, or South and Central America especially, 
not because they had an army, but because they took smallpox with them. And it caused the population, for instance, in Mexico to go from 30 million to 1 million. And so we see how these different major periods of world history went through massive change because of pandemics. The, the Roman Empire, um, the East, um, the, the West of the empire collapsed because of smallpox. The, no, uh, the, uh, the other way around, the powers of plague, and then the East because of smallpox. The coming of Islam was helped by plague, killing off the armies of Persia and Byzantium. Feudalism was ended by the Black Death in the 1300s in Europe and so on. So the turning points of history um, often came through pandemics, the same with COVID-19. There'll be a new normal. And how should we respond? This is my basic challenge. We have to release a lot of what happened in the past, rethink things, adapt to a new reality, and then use the new opportunities that come. Just to give you one example of the future opportunities. Um, because in, in many countries, we've had to do this isolation or, 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 or um, making bubbles or, you know, shut in our homes, lockdowns and all sorts of other strategies to try and stop contact between people. And so people have begun to realize I'm not getting my connection with other people in the same way. My family, uh, my, uh, or my family, I just haven't been able to see them for a, a year and a half. And this is because of the pandemics. So there's a desire to meet up again. And so this can be used for the gospel. Let's use the opportunities that this new normal is creating. But what is unchanging? Um, and this is so important. Let's not get pessimistic about the future because there are things that are not changing. We think of our reigning Lord. And Jesus is on the throne. And we are seated with him. If we only take that position by faith, we have authority in this world. God wants to use us to be a blessing to the world. And so we see our reigning Lord. And actually, I've had such a privilege of being alive over the period that I have. Because during the, uh, my years of serving Jesus, we have seen one of the most amazing turnings to God the world has ever seen. And sadly, most Christians don't realize that. And I just want to give you a few illustrations of that. So let's be encouraged, even in the midst of the kind of problems we are facing now. And so what we're seeing is this awakening across the world. Um, just let me take you back in history when it all sta really started. William Carey was a Baptist uh, pastor and he preached a sermon that changed the world. He challenged ministers in this church to, to support missions, to take the gospel to the heathen. And in fact, one of the ministers stood up and said, sit down, young man. If God wants to convert the heathen, he'll do it without your help. <laughs> which is the exact opposite of what we realize is in the Great Commission, where Jesus sent us. He promised all authority that we would have access to, to be able to take the gospel, to make disciples of all over the world. And so this is William Carey, and he went out to India. And it's interesting, uh, the effect. He wrote a book that went around the world. Look at the title of it. I do not think it would sell many copies today if you saw a title like that. An inquiry into the obligations of Christians to use means for the conversion of the heathens. I mean, we don't use the word heathen anymore because it is derogatory. It speaks down to people. But the important word there is means. God wants us to use 
means. What are they? Well, praying. Uh, William Carey challenged Christians to pray for world evangelization. And he challenged them to start mission agencies that would take the gospel and be supported by churches. And that set the pattern for the next 230 years of prayer and going. And it's changed the world. In fact, when uh, the 200 years of William Carey's arrival in India came about, he arrived in 1793, the Indian government, the Hindu Indian government, produced a special stamp to celebrate his arrival. They weren't pro-Christian, but look at all the different things on that envelope of the first day the stamp was produced. And on that collage on the left-hand side are all the things that Kerry actually did for India. It's starting the first Bengali newspaper. It's stopping Sooty, the killing of widows, of agriculture, of education. He had such a massive influence. And he really gives us a model for the future that we Christians are not only preaching the gospel, but we live the gospel. We make sure that our fellow humankind is affected in a positive way because uh, we are there. And so William Carey set a standard there that um, we should emulate. So those are the different things that he achieved in India. But now look at what happened as a result of that beginning of what we call the, the modern missionary uh, movement. After a hundred years of William Carey going to India, the amount that was achieved in church growth was relatively small. In fact, it was probably only about five to 10 million people by that time who'd become Christians in what, in those red areas. The yellow areas had been to an extent traditionally Christian with the exception of Australia, New Zealand, which was settled by Europeans. Um, but basically the world still hadn't been much affected. By 1960, it had begun to change, especially Africa. But basically, there still was not the breakthrough. But when we look at 2000, look at the way the yellow color has got so much more. I'll take you back again. Look at um, 1960 and look now at 2000. You can see that yellow and orange spreading and spreading. Look at even China with the breakthroughs that have taken there with the gospel. But look at Central Africa. So there was a great revival in East Africa. And I had the privilege of being in Kenya at the tail end of that revival around the time of independence. And it was wonderful to see the God's grace impacting millions of African Christians who became radiant Christians for Jesus. And so you can see the effect of that on, in those yellow areas in Africa. And so over the, these, the, the, the last four decades, the 40 years at the end of the 20th century was what I call a time of awakening across the world. It brought together Bible-believing Christians, both from the Reformation stream, from the Pentecostal stream, and the Charismatic stream. And there was a huge working together in great world conferences, and the impact was most affected in Africa in the 60s, and it has gone on, but basically the 1960s was Africa's time. The 1970s was more Latin America a nominally Catholic continent suddenly became more Protestant than Catholic during that time and beyond. The 1980s was more East and Southeast Asia. We think of the great growth of the church in China and Korea and Indonesia. And then Central Asia after the fall of communism. 
um, the numbers there were far less, but it was a, an area that had hardly been touched with the gospel, but then became open. But what we're now seeing is that we're beginning to see the breakthrough among, in the Muslim world. I'll come back to that in the next session. And so look at a few examples. Here's China. And you can see a map drawn by uh, a friend of mine, Paul Hathaway, a New Zealander. He's, he's Maori and he became a missionary in China and had wonderful links with house church leaders in China. And as a result of his relationships and knowledge of China, he has produced amazing statistics of how the church in China has grown. On that map, the darker the color, the more, uh, more, the more the number of Christians. And so even under communism, the church has grown. Now, of course, with the present extreme harshness of the present government, persecution has massively increased and big churches are closing and being blown up. And it's a very difficult situation for the Christians in China. But look at the growth. These are Paul's figures, and you can see every province of China, the total number of living in each, uh, of Christians living in each province is given. And it shows the percentage of the current population in those percentage figures. And then in 2008, we reckon there were 95 or 96 million Christians. It's possibly gone up to 120 million today. But then with the pressures going on, with many leaders in prison, we do not know much about the situation. Here um, is uh, the final one that I showed you earlier of the Muslim world. BMB stands for believers from a Muslim background. That is how um, uh, folk uh, who have a background in Islam prefer to be called. They don't like to be called Muslim converts, as some have done, which is not a right expression anyway. Um, it, it, it's condescending. It, it's confusing. It doesn't clearly state. But believers from a Muslim background is helpful as a, as a concept. But here you can see in millions up the, um, up the left hand side and the years or the decades along the bottom. And here are different things that have affected the Muslim world. Um, the failed coup in Indonesia, the Iranian revolution, Al-Qaeda ar arising, the civil war in Algeria, 9-11. And so we see here, oh, sorry. We see here, the growth of the number of believers who come out of Islam. In 1960, it was only about 60,000 all over the world. But then came the breakthrough in Indonesia and uh, then in other countries later on. But if we take out the Indonesians, we see that there was very little growth until the, the Al-Qaeda, the extremism in the Muslim world has caused many Muslims to doubt and to question the faith of their forefathers. And many have become Christian. And in our church here in the city of Derby in England, we had before the pandemic, about a hundred people who'd come out of Islam from the Middle East, from um, Afghanistan, from Kurdistan, from Iran, who'd come to Jesus as believers. It wasn't only from there, but these were the majority in our congregation. Many of them have moved to other parts of the country now, and we've lost a lot uh, over COVID. But basically what we're seeing is an openness that wasn't there before. Another example is a friend of mine, um, uh, Ali Arhab, he's a Kabil from North Africa. They are the indigenous people of Algeria who were there before the Arabs invaded and conquered and forced Islam on the Christian Kabil. 
But the, uh, the Christian Kabil then became Muslim under duress. But in recent years, there's been a massive breakthrough uh, of the gospel there. And possibly 300,000 believers now exist among the Kabil. And uh, so earlier, uh, uh, another friend of mine who's long been with Jesus, Charles Marsh, he wrote a book, Too Hard for God, he wrote about Algeria, because almost everyone he led to Jesus, he also had to bury because they were killed by the Muslims. But now, look, here's a church in Algeria um, of Kabil, mainly Kabil, worshipping Jesus. And so praise God. Look at Iran. Their whole attitude to religion has changed because of the corruption and uh, control of the Islamic uh, Shia extremist leaders. And look at those who now claim to be Shia Muslim and those who claim nothing and all the others. The, Muslim, the Shiite Muslims are now only one third of the population. This was a survey recently done by phone to try and work out what the real situation in Iran was. And we reckon today that the number of believers in Iran may be around 2 million. And there were hardly any when the uh, Islamists took control. Then we have global conferences that have taken place. Um, and this has changed our world. Here are a few illustrated um, that have brought Christians together to focus on evangelizing the world. And that has brought it all together and led to a lot of the extraordinary things we've seen in the world. And the other thing that is unchanging is prayer. Prayer affects the world. Um, this is a verse that affected me and was part of my call to Africa. Um, I, I heard about work in the slums of Southern Africa. and That's when God called me. I went to my room and I said, Lord, show me from your word what, what is right. Is this my emotion or is it you? And I opened my Bible and this is the verse that struck me. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. That was said of the father to the son in prophecy, really, uh, a psalm of David a thousand years before Jesus came. But Jesus used a later verse in that, um, in that psalm, and he spoke about it to the churches uh, in Revelation, uh, 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 about uh, being a rod to, uh, to break the nations. So he's showing that this promise actually applies to us too. And so God called me to Africa. I flew out to South Africa um, in 1962. So you can see how ancient I am. And it took three days to fly there because they, the planes were very slow then. But I was one of the first aeroplane missionaries. And so um, uh, the first language I learned was Afrikaans, then Zulu. And that's an interesting language because it has clicks in it. For instance, the squirrel in Zulu is ikaka. And I wonder if you could say that. Or a frog, ikoko. And it's uh, a, kind of a range of sounds that are not known in most languages of the world. Anyway, one of the, uh, I was an evangelist leading a team of African brothers and sisters. And I was wanting to prepare them to be leaders. And praise God, that happened. But I also began writing uh, books to help African Christians pray for the world. The first one, there you can see it, 1964. Then another one in 1973, all done in Zimbabwe. And then this was the last one I did before I handed over. Uh, I discipled another guy, Jason Mandrick, who then took over from me. We did this book together. And that was all part of my handover. I'm very strong that any ministry we have, we must prepare for handover straight away. 
It may take years, but we aim for it. Anyway, this is the book uh, I wrote. And then my first year wife, Jill, she wrote uh, the earlier version of that um, to help children to pray for the world. And then this is the latest edition of Operation World that my successors were able to produce. And um, what is unchanging? Our commission. Um, Jesus has sent us. And these are the final statements of Jesus in his resurrection ministry. Five times he challenged his disciples, and each time it was in a different context and in a different, with a different emphasis. Mark was preached the gospel to every creature. There's evangelism. Matthew, go and make disciples of all peoples. That's the discipling or church planting element. Luke emphasized what the scriptures taught about Jesus, its teaching. Then we have the sending command when Jesus is the, said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And then in Acts 1.8, which we'll come to in a minute, is the strategy. And so this was Jesus' last command and how few churches obey it. And many of you are preparing theologically for serving the Lord. And if you end up in church ministry, Make sure that at the front of everything you do is obedience to the last command of Jesus. Too many churches have forgotten this. In my country here, that disastrous failure to heed the last command of Jesus has become a very serious matter. Missions now is emptied of meaning. It just means anything you do for Jesus outside the church. Well, to an extent that's true. But the trouble is it takes away the idea that we've got to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, this is the final command of Jesus. You remember Jesus said, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. And he wants us to go. And we just got to find out where at any point in our life he wants us to go to. So what should our focus be in the 21st century? And I want to go on to that in our next session. Um, I want, to, want us to look at this command a bit more, that in fact, Jerusalem is a city. And there's also implied in that, that cities need to be reached. Judea was a country where the Jews lived. So we must have countries in our minds when we think about the world. And then Samaria, they were the immigrants many centuries before, but the Jews hated them because they still regarded them after 500 years as invaders or, or uh, implants from elsewhere that didn't belong to them. And yet Jesus said, go to the Samaritans. So peoples must be considered refugees or indigenous. And then we must take the gospel to the ends of the earth where religions can be very different. So that's where we're heading in the next session. Um, I'm also going to add that we will need to, um, we will need to look at um, netizens. How are we going to evangelize people over the internet? There are many evil things happening with the internet, many distortions. But how are we as Christians going to make use of that? And so that is my first session. So I'll hand over back to you, Jeff. Okay, thank you very much for your marvelous teaching. And um, it's now uh, three to, um, it's 2.47 at the moment. So. Uh, why don't we just come back uh, in about 10 minutes so um, then I will just move on to the next session. Yeah. So we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Yeah. Right. So welcome back, everyone. And uh, what I, as I promised earlier, I want us to focus now on the future 
And what are the challenges ahead for us in the 21st century? And um, I know I'm, I'm ancient. I'm actually now almost 83. Um, but I want to be forward looking in my thinking. But it's not me that's going to do it anymore. It is you folk. And so the first thing I would mention are cities. And as I do that, I just want to underline something that is a major shift in our thinking that we need. Um, and I was speaking with Jeff a little bit earlier on this, that you know, for so long, we focused on the frontier missions, the idea of unreached peoples. And we immediately think of deserts, of mountains, of forests, of remote areas where uh, different ethnic and linguistic groups might live. But as we move into the 21st century, we are living in the first urban century. And so we have to have a parallel of thinking of how we handle cities, which are growing, and the rural areas which are declining in numbers, and often mostly older people. And so um, we have to have a, a two-track thinking in all we do. How does what we do in the frontier area relate to what is going on in the cities? How do the cities affect the rural? And how do we look globally at the peoples who are moving from cities to cities? And one of the remarkable things about the world in which we live is the mobility of peoples. And just to give one example, many Somali people fled from the civil war in that unhappy country, and they went to Netherlands. But then a politician came along who was very right wing and anti-immigrant. And almost overnight, a whole lot of the Somali population moved to Canada and the USA. And so suddenly, all the work you might have been doing amongst the Somalis has disappeared. And so we have to have this flexible approach. And let's not get too fixed on one way of working. We might change, have to change enormously. And so one of the things that we are going to have to develop in our strategy is flexibility. Anyway, cities. Um, here is a diagram which shows the po total population living in rural areas and urban areas. These are figures from the United Nations. And one of the great things the United Nations has done is collating global statistics about cities, about health, about a whole range of things. And these become wonderful bases on which we can um, build our planning for the future. But there you can see that in 2007, the orange line crossed the green line. In other words, after 2007, there are more people living in cities than in rural areas. So in the 21st century, it's going to be increasingly urban. Now, one of the problems of working in a city, how do you get noticed? You see, if you are a, a well-educated missionary with lots of money and you go to a rural area, you completely dominate the culture locally. They come, uh, they come to the mission station for health, for education, that is the pattern of the past, but it leads to a dependence, but it leads to the missionary getting a great prominence locally. And so their message is then easily heard. But when you move to a city, who is going to notice you? And the only way we can function as effective missionaries in the 21st century is to go back to the command of Jesus to disciple. And the key to any mission work all through history has not been on how many people you win to Jesus, but how many leaders you gradually see formed 
who can become the dynamic people of the future. And so the missionary is important as the initial discipler. And the quality of that discipling work is going to determine the next generations of ministry. And so in cities, befriending the right people, give it, uh, the, the man of peace or whatever term we might use, this is the, the, the pattern of the future. I was an urban missionary right from the beginning of my career in the 1960s. I worked in slums. I was working with people who'd been gangsters, who'd been abused, who'd had every form of problem. It took 10 years to see them become mature, liberated leaders, but wonderfully it came. And so a number of them went on to become wonderful men and women of God, but it takes a long time. And so I didn't see, I, maybe I saw hundreds of people come to Jesus through my witness, but that wasn't the important thing. It was those 10 or 15 African men and women who I lived with, who I worked with, where I see my greatest work was. And I think we have to keep this in mind as we look to the future. Okay, city contrasts. What we see here is Mumbai, and you can see the slums. Um, it's great to witness in the business class to see people, one, who are the movers and shakers, but we mustn't forget the poor. And uh, we were exhorted by Jesus not to forget the poor. The poor you will always have with you. And we must keep the balance in our ministry of making sure that the influencers, as well as those who are oppressed, receive the gospel and are transformed by it. But now look at the growth of cities. I mentioned how the 21st century is the first urban century. Now here are all the cities in the world in 2000 that had over 1 million people. And there you can see those many little blue dots and you can just see one meta city as they call it, over 20 million people. That is Tokyo where the Olympic games are now being held and um, where there are now said to be about 32 million people living in the greater Tokyo area. But look at the situation that is likely to be in th three years time, four years time. Look at the red uh, circles, how they've increased. So we see these massive cities coming. Some of them are almost unlivable in. Um, I don't know if any of you here have been to Lagos, for instance, in Africa. Um, watch that city because it's growing, but it is chaotic. But now look at the situation as it's likely to be in 2050. I'll be long gone to glory by then. Many of you will still be ministering in 2050. And look at the world swamped with cities and probably, I don't know what it will be, probably about 70% of all people on earth will then be living in a city. And so city ministry is vital. And some of these are so large, um, you can see those circles, you're going to have belts of cities across countries that are linked together. And you can see those uh, six belts of cities that are going to be virtually no countryside in between with buildings everywhere. Think of the pollution, think of the squalor, think of the slums. It's a chaotic world uh, of these mega cities. Now look at the 10 top cities of the world. This is what it was in 2000. Tokyo and Mexico City and Mumbai, they were the top cities. But look at the change by 2025. Mumbai has gone to the top and Lagos in Africa is second. And Tokyo has been pushed down. And then we see the top 10 cities in 2050. Lagos is likely then to be the uh, biggest city in the world 
with 64 million people. I just can't conceive of an African city that size with probably 80 to 90% living in substandard or slum housing and what it's going to be like. How are they going to deal with the sewage, with the, with the rubbish? How are they going to have clean air? How are they going to be able to survive with food? And where are they going to get jobs from? And so it goes on. And so we face a real challenge in dealing with the cities. But it's not just the cities that we have to deal with. We cannot forget countries. Um, this is uh, an important concept, though many people have played it down. Uh, we don't just want to evangelize countries. We want to evangelize the cities and the peoples in them. But all statistics are usually collected by country. And so with Operation World, for instance, we do it by country, because that is the way statistics work. We know how many Methodists there are in a country. We know how many, uh, how many children under six there are in a country, because a country collects that type of information. And therefore, we can make plans using those statistics. We in Britain have a very interesting uh, postcode system. Um, and the postcode, uh, I live in a postcode DE3 and 0PY. And that defines the street where I live. So just with seven uh, um, letters and numbers, you can locate every part of the country to a few houses. And we have all the statistics for religions, for ethnicity, for country of birth, and so on. And the amazing maps you can produce with this information, it gives us the ability to plan. So countries are important still. Um, and then we can branch out into our understanding of the components of peoples and cities. But the least evangelized countries of the world, these are generally speaking, in what has been called the 1040 window. 10 degrees north of the equator to 40 degrees north of the equator and between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. And within that blue window are most of the people of the world who have never heard the gospel. It's crude. There are some areas there that are in the red circles which are outside that window, um, but where the need is huge, where very few are Christian. But there are countries within, like coastal China, Korea, and Chad, and, uh, and South Sudan, where the Christians are many within the window. And so it is only a very crude representative uh, way of, represent, uh, of showing where the greatest needs are. And um, therefore it's helpful, but let's bear in mind its limitations too. But there you can see the countries across the world that most need the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And some of you come from that area. I've already spoken to some of you from the, the Gambia and uh, so on. But then let's <clears throat> Look at the nations of the world. How far has the gospel spread? There are about 245 nations in the world today. And 156 are majority Christian, at least in name. And one of the reasons why there are so many is that many are islands and small islands. And they were the areas first evangelized in the missionary uh, and the beginning of missionary work, like in the Pacific. Most of the islands in the Pacific are solidly Christian today. And so you have got lots of tiny states that are largely Christian, like in the Caribbean and so on. But then the next um, batch of countries, 25 of them, like South Korea, where you are now, um, it is not a Christian country. The churches are many and huge, you only have to look across the skyline in Seoul, which those of you who came from other countries would probably be a memorable thing when you first saw it 
you look out and you see the whole country, co whole city covered with red neon crosses um, showing where churches are. And so the, the church has had a huge impact, uh, although it is still only a minority of the population. Then you get other countries, huge countries like India, China, where there's quite a significant church, but the percentage is below 10%. And then you've got a range of countries, 29 of them, where there are less than 1% Christian. And many of them are much smaller. Not, uh, there are bigger countries there too. But basically these are the pioneer lands where there are not enough Christian workers to reach every part and every people, every settlement in the country with the gospel. And so that is the kind of challenge uh, we face uh, as we look to the future. There are 64 countries of the world where the number of evangelical Christians is uh, not enough to do the work without outside help. And here you can see the least evangelized countries of the world. And by this, I'm defining it in a way that we wrestled about um, 30 years ago, trying to say, how can we define the least evangelized countries in the world? And we chose an arbitrary uh, set of figures, less than 2% Christian, uh, evangelical, and less than 5% Christian. The reason for these figures is that where there's a Christian um, presence that may not be very uh, uh, much proclaiming the gospel. I mean, you've got countries where there are quite a lot of Christians, but not many really born again. Um, but then with evangelicals, we are pretty sure that quite a proportion of them have a personal knowledge of Jesus. But these figures include not only the believers, but their children too. Otherwise, we can't compare with Muslims. Muslims count all children and adults, and we have to do the same with evangelicals to show that we are comparing like with like. Now, here are the countries. Um, the, this shows the percentage of evangelicals in those countries. This shows the percentage of Christian. And you can see all of the first one are less than 2%. And all the second one are less than 5%. But notice now the religions. Notice how many of them are Muslim. So one of the huge challenges we face in the 21st century, how are we going to reach the Muslim populations? I'll come to that later. But some of them are Buddhist. One, of course, is Jewish. But then we also look at the least evangelized countries of the world, where there is a Christian, a larger Christian presence, but where there are few evangelical churches. And then we get a completely different list. Here's that list. And you can see the evangelical percentage is low, but the Christian percentage is often very high. And so you have a, often in these countries, you have a large uh, um, um, nominal Christian population that have no understanding about a personal faith in Jesus. And so we see them equally as needing the gospel. And there you can see the religions of the different, the main religions of the different countries. You can see many are Catholic, some are Muslim, a few are non-religious, and one is even Protestant. Greenland, and <laughs> it's nominally Protestant, but with very few committed believers. And so these are the 64 countries of the world that are most needing input. But then we need to look at peoples too. And a lot of my work in research has been contributing to the lists of peoples, which we've gradually and painstakingly put together because I don't know whether you realize, but until um, about 1955, we didn't have a list of the languages of the world. And then that was begun by Wycliffe 
SIL, we didn't have a list of the peoples of the world. And that was begun by David Barrett, and I've had a lot of contribution into that. And out of that emerged the lists we have today. But they were only published for the first time fully in 2001. And so until 2001, we didn't have a reasonably complete list of all the peoples and languages of the world. And Jesus told us to go and make disciples of each one of them. So at last we do have a clearer picture. And here I've tried to simplify it down. The Joshua Project, uh, which I hope many of you have looked at online, because it gives us there uh, one of the lists that is extant. They basically all have uh, are descended from the original list that David Barrett, and to an extent I, helped to contribute. And so here you see this list, taking out all the castes of India, which is included in the Joshua Project, and taking out many of the languages that are almost dead, we end up with about 12, 13,000 peoples. And here it's very simplified, 6,000 of the 12,000 approximately are majority Christian. Another 3,000 are where great breakthroughs have occurred, like in Korea, like amongst the Chinese in Singapore, and so on, where there are vibrant churches, but they're still not a majority in their ethnic group. And then you've got the 3,000 or so peoples of the world where pioneer work is still needed in part or in whole. The 3,000 there are made up of those which need pioneer work, but where work already exists. Most of them are very large. And the total population of that is probably about 3 million, uh, 3 billion, I mean. But then we have the final column, which is the least reached, about a 1,000. But many of them are very small. And so the numbers, the actual populations involved, are not uh, equal at all. But then we've divided them up now into 15 major, what we call affinity blocks. So we've got Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, the brown. We've got the Arab world, which is green. Or we've got the um, Chinese, uh, um, Mongo um, type, there of the, of the yellow. We've got the Turkic peoples, which are purple. And so we've got these major blocks of peoples where there's a lot of commonalities. Languages are often related, or at least the cultures are related, though there may be many widely different languages spoken. And so there we can see, but within each of those are about 250 clusters of peoples, like the Somalis, or like the Kurds, or like the Chinese, or something like that. And so here we see, uh, well, I, I won't speak about that now, but here's India. These are the languages of India, but across this also go the castes, which I have not spoken about. But basically, you can see the main people clusters of India. And India is like a continent. And in fact, South India does not use Hindi, which is the uh, so-called national language. But because um, the British united India um, by conquest or treaty, um, it became a unified country, but look at the diversity. And um, English has become the main language by which they communicate with one another. In actual fact, it's been an enormous benefit to India because they're able to function all over the world because of their knowledge of English. And that is one of the reasons why most, many of the biggest internet companies in the world uh, often run from the States, are actually led by Indians. They have a remarkable talent in mathematics and computers. And English has been the help 
for them to become global. But there you can see the complexity of India, which we now have a pretty good grasp of what it's like. But this is how far the gospel has gone. You can see little pockets of orange, which means majority Christian. And then you can see the light shade of blue where there are many Christians, but a minority. And then you can see the dark where there are hardly any Christians at all. Certain areas of India, like Manipur and so on, are not even shown on this map because they belong to a different category of, uh, and to a different affinity block, the Southeast Asian one. But here's the affinity block for the Persian world. And you can see how it spreads into China and all the way over into Turkey. And in the center is Iran, which is a very important country in the world today, a very difficult country. But there you can see the people cluster. And you can see the, uh, the, uh, the, the affinity block, but within it are a number of these people clusters. Now that helps us very much to look at the world in this way and simplify things a little bit. For instance, uh, there are many languages spoken in Iran that are related, but when they go to another country, they tend to congregate together whatever their local languages or dialects were, and we just know them as a Farsi speakers. And so whenever they move, they tend to clump together in the larger people cluster. So we need as missions and as churches to think more in terms of people clusters than individual people groups. I hope you can get the difference. So there are about 15 affinity blocks, about 250 people clusters in the world, and about 15,000 people groups. And that gives you some idea of the way we can make it like a branched tree and how we can strategize at the level we need. But we also know now not only who these peoples are, but we also know um, what their religions are. And so here, these are the people, uh, people groups within the people cluster of the Persians. We also know how many have emigrated. And there you can see the emigrants. So you can see most of them are Muslim. And some of them have migrated to other countries, especially the Persians. And we know how many people groups there are within each um, um, main people, main uh, group. And so we have such an accurate picture today. We've got no excuse to make sure that every people in every country is reached. Here's Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see the different uh, people clusters being written out uh, in that little chart at the bottom right. And you can see the largest one of all is Adabantu. And uh, most of the African languages I speak are Bantu languages in the brown area. And they're all related. And it's fascinating, the grammar of a Bantu language is more or less the same right across the continent. Swahili too, which is also related to Bantu, the Bantu languages, has the same kind of build up. And once you learn one, you know the grammar for the others, even if the words are very different. West Africa is much more complicated because it is believed that that is where humanity originated. So the varieties there have had more time to develop. And then we know the whole situation with regard to the people clusters. How many are Muslim? How many are Christian? The yellow, green for Islam. How many are of traditional religions? The blue. And then you can see how many peoples there are in each category of Christianization. And so we have this whole picture of what is going on. And here's one country with a breakdown by cluster and uh, uh, individual peoples. We know how far the gospel has spread. 
And you can see there the orange, which is Christian majority, the purple, uh, the dark blue, which is very few Christians, and in between that muddle. And if you ever read about what is happening in Nigeria, you'll know that there's huge conflict going on between the herders who are Muslim and the cultivators who are non-Muslim generally. And there's a huge amount of terrorism, of violence, of war, and the government is not controlling it. And so it's a very unhappy situation for that country. And one of the main perpetrators of this violence are the Fulbe, or uh, herding people, right across Africa. If God were to get a grip on this people, it would affect the whole of West Africa. And there you can see uh, their kind of lifestyle in the photograph. You can see the different peoples and then their languages, which are all related. And so this, what, 30 million uh, Fulbe um, People cluster is strategic for Africa and their region. But we've had work from our my mission agency in West Africa amongst the Fulbe for 70 years, and we still haven't seen the breakthrough. There have been breakthroughs in some countries, and there you can see that evidence. You can see a few of these um, peoples um, with a little bit of yellow. And basically, we haven't really made an impact yet. And there you can see the religions across Africa by ethnic group. And you can see where there are still many of traditional religions, where many are Muslim and where many are Christian. And so there's a conflict zone right across Africa, uh, which is intense activity by both Muslims and Christians to win over people to their different uh, faiths. But it's a real challenge, this African situation. But conflict has arisen. And um, now it's very dangerous to work in that area where there are stars because of the violence that's going on, often instigated by Muslim extremists. And so that's the situation. Then there are other conflicts going on too, that are within Islam, they're the blue one. And so one of the factors of Islam, which I may be able to mention uh, later, are causing many Muslims to come to Jesus. But look at the effect of climate change and look at the areas that are going to be most effective. The darker the red, uh, the greater the impact of, global, uh, of, uh, of um, climate change. And look at the Sahara. And this is what we are beginning to see. And so we're going to see millions of refugees from these areas, especially I would say Pakistan and the, the Sahel region of Africa are going to provide millions of refugees. How are we going to deal with them? And um, there are the conflicts in the Sahel that were taking place in 2019. In fact, I was speaking at a conference in Burkina Faso in March last year, as COVID was beginning to strike the world. That was my last overseas uh, speaking tour. And here are the uh, herders and jihadists in Africa. And there are refugees imprisoned in Libya, wanting to go to Europe. And millions are trying to flee the poverty and war in Africa. How are we going to reach them? And displaced populations have so increased in the last 25 years. And this is something we keep in our reckoning, that the flow of, um, uh, of refugees is going to increase over the next 40 years. And look at what is happening in, in the developed world. The population is declining. And so we've got more and more older people who need to be supported by the younger people. And so there's a population gap. You can see there, this is, this is what is called uh, an age pyramid. And I've put together Af Africa, Asia, Latin America, 
and on the other side, the green, Europe, North America, the Pacific. And you can see the old people at the top, babies at the bottom. And you can see how many there are in millions on each side. And you can see how in Europe, there's a population deficit. And that is going to be filled whether we like it or not. Whatever laws we pass, whatever navies we put round Britain or whatever, they're going to come. And so we as Christians need to welcome the strangers, whatever our government policies are, because that is the future of the world. And those are the ones who are more likely to come to Jesus. And then the religions of the world, just very, very briefly, I've already mentioned this. There are six major streams of religion in the world. And there you can see them, the Muslims and the, the different branches and the fighting, the hatred between the two branches, main branches of Islam, Shia and Sunni, are really focused in on the Middle East. Iran is Shia and Saudi Arabia is Sunni and they hate each other and yet they are both Muslims. And uh, that hatred is causing many of the wars in the Middle East at the moment. And they're the ones who are beginning to respond to the gospel now. But then we also have the Hindu and the traditional local religions, blue, the Buddhists and the non-religious, which is growing. And um, but then just think a little bit of how Muslims feel. Um, this shows the superpowers since the time of Jesus. Because if you look right at the beginning here, at the time of Jesus in 100, Rome and Persia and China, they were the world powers of the time. And you can see all through history, the continuity. But the big change came with the coming of Islam, the green. And the Arabs made use of the uh, devastation caused by the plague um, and they were able to conquer the main countries of the Middle East and then spread across the center of the world population and they became the superpower for a thousand years and they've lost that to the West and the West is beginning to lose their grip now but the conflict between the Muslim world and the rest of the world, they believe they should conquer the world. And so the anger of Muslims against any who stop that advance is one of the causes for uh, Islamism that is affecting the world. But that very Islamism is dividing the Muslim world. Here's a cartogram. That's a, like a map, but all the countries are the size of the Muslim population. So Pakistan looks bigger than India. Bangladesh looks bigger than India because they've got more Muslims or nearly this, about the same number of Muslims as India. And so you can see the Muslim world, but notice the two different colors of green. Uh, the darker green is Shia, the lighter green is Sunni. And look at the conflicts. All those red dots mean that over the next 40 years, war and killing is likely. Look how much the Muslim world is going to be deeply affected by war. And that is also going to cause a massive flow of refugees. And we need to keep this in recognition. But then we have India, Hindu. We do need to have input into India. The persecution of Christians is increased, but the Christians are largely in the south, the northeast, and amongst tribal peoples within India, main part of India. And most of India remains completely unevangelized. And so how are we going to handle India? We have the caste structure. Look where Muslims have come from within Hinduism. Look where Christians have come from. The green is Muslim, looks like a baseball bat. Very few have become Muslim out of the upper castes and very few Christians have come from the upper castes. 
most have come from the poorer part of society. And so how are the poor origin people going to evangelize the upper? It's a huge challenge because they're immediately rejected because of what their surname looks like. Um, they are despised. So that caste system is like a great curse on India, but it's there and real. There are the Muslims um, in South Asia, and it's a huge conflict area too. There are the Christians. I'm not going to speak more about that because my time is up and um, I'm going to leave that. And so the final thing I just want to say as I wrap up, is if we're going to evangelize the world, we also need to make use of the internet with all its positives and negatives. And so we need netizens who are going to know how to use Zoom better than I can, and how we can use different tools that God is giving us to evangelize people in difficult countries by using this medium. And so really, that's my challenge. We need a new category of missionary, Zoomists. And that is something of the challenge we face. Now, I am drawing to a conclusion and it's over to you for questions. So Jeff, I hand over to you. I'll stop screen sharing. <laughs>